on December 5th, scientists produced the world's first fusion reaction with net energy gain, a major milestone in the decades-long quest to develop a technology that could provide unlimited, cheap, clean power. Simply put, this is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century. Nuclear fusion is the ultimate clean energy dream, the holy grail of carbon-free power that scientists have been chasing for decades. In fact, experiments with fusion go back almost as far as those with fission, with the first fusion bomb detonated by the U.S. in 1952. You know, the thing is that many people have gotten the idea that uh, until, you know, December 5, we didn't know how fusion worked. No, 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 no. How fusion works was understood over 70 years ago. The question is how to do it in a controlled fashion in the laboratory. That was not understood. So, how did they do it? The breakthrough took place at the National Ignition Facility, a part of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, researching high energy science and nuclear deterrence. The facility is the size of a sports stadium and has one of the most powerful laser arrays in the world, and all of it to create a reaction that lasts less than a billionth of a second. So fusion is a reaction between two atoms where they come together to form a heavier atom and energy is also released in that process. And the energy that comes out in that neutron is the energy that we can then harness to use for other experiments or potentially for fusion energy. There's different ways of doing this, using magnets or using lasers. Here we use lasers. They're the result of decades of research and innovation. And the National Ignition Facility itself is unique. There's no other facilities that can deliver the same kind of energy as the NIFCAN currently. It all begins with a single pulse. A stream of photons is amplified and split again and again until there are 192 lasers in total. Their target is a three-story high vessel called the target chamber. Inside, the lasers are directed towards a small capsule called a hole round, containing a pellet of hydrogen atoms about half the size of a BB. As the beams strike, the high temperature and immense pressure cause the hydrogen atoms to fuse together and release energy, about 50% more than what went into it. The reaction creates what amounts to a miniature star. It was clear it was going to be very hard. And they figured it out. It is amazing. It's an amazing achievement. My first reaction was, uh, oh my gosh, we did it. <laughs> One of our engineers actually thought that there was something wrong with our diagnostic system initially because the signal was so much bigger than what we had anticipated it might be. So as soon as we started to see that very early data coming in, our response was, oh my gosh, this is awesome, we did it. But then as scientists, we have to be very careful before we jump to conclusions. So we went into a period of more intense analysis of all of the data. While the possibilities for fusion are huge, there are a number of challenges it faces before commercial use. The amount of energy from the grid, which charged NIF's large capacitors and created that first laser, was far larger than the net energy gain from fusion by nearly 100 fold. The NIF was actually built using 1990s laser technology because that was the time when we started the project. So in order to make this more efficient, essentially we need better technology. Deuterium, one of the ingredients in the fusion reaction, is abundant in seawater. But the other isotope, tritium, a byproduct of nuclear reactors, is harder to come by. NIF shoots at the power level that was used on December 5, roughly speaking, once a day. If you made a fusion reactor that used a similar kind of reaction, you'd have to shoot 10 times a second, 24-7. You need a lot of pellets, hundreds of thousands of pellets. They have to be made perfectly, just like the one that was used was made perfectly. You have this challenge of then how do you actually use the energy that's coming out to actually produce electricity. But for all its obstacles, there are obvious advantages that scientists are looking forward to with fusion. When we burn fossil fuels, uh, we all know that we release a lot of um, greenhouse gases that can be harming to our environment. With nuclear energy sources, both fission and fusion, we're not releasing those same kinds of products. And then fusion has the as added advantage that it's about four times more efficient per unit mass than fission is. 
And it's also a much cleaner source of energy because we don't produce those uh, radioactive spent fuel uh, products that fission reactors produce. So when could fusion actually power our homes? That's the trillion dollar question. Experts argue that it's not a matter of time, but a matter of money. Ultimately, the decision would be made at the political level. Money matters, especially when budgets are being thought about. And uh, so I'm not so sure what will happen. The success of uh, the experiment on December 5th, it's sort of like that Wright Brothers moment where it's a proof of principle. We took the first flight. You know, that flight wasn't something that was going to get anyone anywhere in terms of actual transport. It was many, many years before we got to full scale, you know, commercial travel by aircraft in the U.S. I think we're in a similar state right now with fusion energy, where probably it's going to be um, at least one to two decades before we would see a commercially viable fusion energy source. But it launched, it, it launched our understanding. It helped us know that it was possible.